Friends, this is Dr. Jim Daly with Astronomy for Change, and welcome to our next edition of The Night Sky. Today's Thursday, August 15th, 2019, and as we watch in the sun, watch in the west as the sun slowly sets, we're going to take a look to the east and observe as the full observe the full moon at its rising. Okay, the full moon is the only phase that rises as the sun sets. So let's take a look over here to the east and watch the full moon rise. There it is. The moon is rising between east and southeast. It's east-southeast. This is just the beginning of twilight. And there it is. We'll pause the sky there and take a look. That's what we call, for August, the full sturgeon moon. Now, each month's name uh, for the moon, full moon name, has its uh, basis or its origins in um, Indian lore. The indigenous people of this continent used to assign names to the full moon for each month, given certain, uh, based on certain aspects of their life and their culture, and uh, that had to do with the relationship, a very close relationship with the environment and the earth. In this particular case, for August, we have a full sturgeon moon. Sturgeon is a fish, and the ancients, or the Indians rather, named the full moon in August as the sturgeon moon, since the species was abundant during this month, especially in the Great, Slake, Great Lakes region of, this, of the North American continent and other major bodies of water. Now, if you take a look at the uh, Farmer's Almanac, which we have here, we not only have a full moon calendar, in the Farmer's Almanac, farmersalmanac.com. We can um, scroll down, take a look at the calendar for the month. Here we have, this is the 15th, okay? That's the full moon, okay? 15th of August. Tomorrow night, the 16th, will be the moon at like 98% illumination and continuing on its path as it wanes in phase towards new moon, which is in approximately two weeks. Now, if we take a look here, go to astronom uh, time, farmersalmanac.com for the calendar, moon phases, we're in astronomy, and we can select moon phase calendar, we can full, select full moon names here, and that'll give us uh, the full moon names and their meanings. It's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting insight into um, how the, in, how the, the natives, uh, the native indigenous to this continent, uh, were so closely uh, connected to the environment and the earth. Here we're coming up here. April's moon is a pink full moon, full pink moon. Full flower moon is in May. Full strawberry moon is in June. That's the, uh, the time of the year when strawberries were being harvested. Full buck moon was last month, July, and here it is in August. We have the full sturgeon moon. Uh, the, fishing, or the fishing tribes of the North American continent are given a lot of credit for the naming of this moon, since sturgeon, a large fish of the Great Lakes and other major fishing bodies of water, were mostly readily caught during this month. A few tribes knew it as the full red moon because as the moon rise, it would appear reddish, though sultry, and through any sultry haze. It was also called, called the green corn moon uh, also. Uh, so that's the full moon for August, the full sturgeon moon. Let's go back to Stellarium. Here's the moon still rising. Take a look now in the setting that we've grown accustomed to here in the previous sequence of videos. Uh, we open up with a view looking to the south. Mighty Jupiter and Saturn still high in the south uh, at uh, the close of twilight, coming up soon. Now keep in mind also as the 
since the full moon is out uh, this night tonight, a lot of the uh, more subtle object, the fainter, the subtle beauty of the Milky Way, that might be lost, or that will be lost because of the moon's brilliance. Okay, so if we want, if we're interested in observing those aspects of the sky, the, the, the beauty of the Milky Way, the star clusters that we've been talking about recently, you should wait until the moon is first quarter, first quarter, or an hour, or third quarter, or an hour. Anything below first quarter or third quarter, back towards new moon or crescent moon, would be a good time to observe. Or well, the new moon, of course, when there's no moon, to observe these um, these features of the sky, these aspects of the sky. So that's the um, the sky looking due south. Now, if we go back to um, our browser here, take a look at this image. This is an image that I acquired uh, back in you know, a few years ago of the strawberry moon, the full moon. This was obtained with a, um, a modest telescope used as an astrograph. Okay, you can see all the features of the moon. Here's the crater Tycho. Over here is the bright red is the bright uh, is the red supergiant star Antares. Okay, so the moon, the moon had just occulted or passed in front of this star right here. That's the uh, the red supergiant star Antares, which we've spoken about at, at length in our series of videos. Okay, and here it is, Antares. So back then the moon was sitting right here, right next to Antares, and that was back in June a few years ago during the strawberry moon, and the moon occulted Antares, and that was that image was the aftermath of that um, of that occultation. It gives us an opportunity uh, with uh, professional observatory class telescopes we can study the star's atmosphere as the limb of the moon basically just very slowly cuts off the star's disk uh, for these large red giant stars. We can do that. Okay. Let's go back and zoom in on the moon here. Full moon. You can see the illumination of the moon down here. Solarium gives that information to us, 99.6%. It's just 0.4% uh, not illuminated because the, the actual specific time, uh, although the date for August, full moon for this month is August 15th, the specific time is not at this moment, so hence it's not going to be 100% illuminated. Okay. I'd like to also, while we're talking about the moon, is something I want to mention, everybody. Some, a feature that we added to our to our website for each one of our stories, our blog posts, we have a a feature on the web post web page that provides the full moon phase, current moon phase. That'll be available in any post that we open up that you open up in the news and articles section. You click here. Uh, you select uh, either article index which is a work in pro progress, <clears throat> excuse me, where you can choose a story, a previous story, or a story recent, uh, previously published, or anything new within the last four posts. So you click News and Articles and select either Article Index or Latest Stories. Here, in this, uh, in this feature here, the current phase is full. It's currently in the constellation of Aquarius, and the moon is 14 days old, which is consistent with the, the lunar uh, cycle of 29.5 days. The distance is 63 Earth radii, so uh, 63 times, that's about 6,400 kilometers is one Earth radius. So that's how far the moon is from us at this moment. Um, and other various uh, aspects of the moon phase for tonight. Okay, so take a look at that the next time you open one of our articles. This uh, feature will be there, so give you a sense of what to expect if you go outside and look at the sky. Okay. So this is the sky for tonight. Now, keep in mind that the Perseid meteor shower has already, the, the, the date most active for this year's Perseids is, was August 13th, which is three days ago. The period of activity 
where the, the shower is actually active was uh, July 17th through August 24th. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at that again. Turn our meteors back on. Okay, the Perseids are going to be coming up pretty soon. Right now, this is almost 9 p.m. Moon is slowly rising. It's a lot of, uh, see, look here. These meteor showers are in Aquarius. Northern Aquarius, Southern Aquarius, Southern Delta Aquarius, right? So the moon then uh, is, going, is in the constellation of Aquarius, the water bearer, the water bearer. Okay. Aquarius. Right here. Okay. Let's let this guy drift ahead a little bit. It's coming up on 1030. And Perseus will be coming up pretty soon in the northeast. It's already there. Here we go. Perseus, click the radiant point, give you the properties of the meteor shower. Yeah, see? Maximum was the 13th of August, right? Activity is between the 17th of July and the 24th of August. So even though the moon is full right now, today is the 15th, uh, we have about nine days left. If you want to continue to look for the Perseids, you can do that. The amount of meteors visible during full moon would be less than what you could see in um, other phases of the moon where the moon isn't so brilliant. Okay, the moon's bright, moon is fairly bright. It's going to um, uh, wash out the sky. Uh, so a lot of the fainter objects, a lot of the fainter meteors, the fainter objects that you could see in binoculars or etc., the things, the kind of things that we've been talking about, those wouldn't be necessarily visible with the full moon. So although um, the meteor shower was still active, you might want to wait a few days, perhaps over the weekend, Sunday or Monday, to see uh, the Perseids. Take a look at the Perseids before we lose lose them until next year, which will be on the 24th of August. So this is now almost, this is almost 11.30 at night. What I want to do is um, point out two more objects we talked about in the previous video. We talked about um, the, star, the globular star clusters, agglomerations of hundreds of thousands of stars, all bound together by gravity. Many of the stars in those clusters are old stars, many stars dating back to the first stars formed in the universe. Uh, many are red giant stars, uh, represent the latter evolutionary stages of stars like our sun. Okay, what I want to talk about tonight, let's pretend that the moon isn't here, or uh, better still, let's turn off the atmosphere, which eliminates the, uh, the, moon's, the effect of the moon's brilliance on the sky, allowing us to see um, the sky as it would appear without the atmosphere or with no lights. There's two very uh, beautiful clusters of stars here in this part of the sky. Take a look. One of them is called Messier 11, or the Wild Duck Cluster. Take a look. M11. Right here. Let's zoom in on M11. It's a beautiful cluster of stars. This is the rendering by Stellarium. If we take a look at what it would look like through a pair of binoculars, we have that view right here. Right here. So a nice amateur telescope, uh, maybe 15 or 20 centimeters in diameter, or six to eight inches in diameter, this is what you would see, all right, through a wide field view, of, uh, through a, that size telescope, or a very good pair of binoculars, maybe uh, 10 power by 80 millimeters in diameter, the, uh, each binocular lens. That's, the, that's how you describe the size of binoculars, the magnification times the objective side. The objective is the principal optical element, be it a telescope or a pair of binoculars, we call that the objective. The objective diameter, let's say for a, a nice pair of binoculars to observe the sky with, be like 
uh, 9 by 80s or 10 by 80s or 12 by 80 binoculars, those binoculars you would probably need a tripod for. But this object would be beautiful to look at in, a, in an instrument like that, or a, what we call a wide field or richest field telescope. And these stars consist mostly of, mostly of um, young stars, newly formed stars. You can get the sense of a bluish cast to these stars. That suggests their age as being not only young, but hot, massive stars that are going to be much shorter lived than our sun. Okay, so eventually over time, the clusters in the stars, they don't have the, the gravity, the cluster doesn't have the mass or the amount of number of stars to keep it bound together gravitationally, as is the case with globular star clusters. So over time, the, uh, the proper motion through our galaxy, as it moves through the galaxy, those stars will sooner or later eventually drift apart to become scattered amongst the rest of the stars in the Milky Way. Okay, so you get a sense that this is, because the stars are young, you can get a sense of their age, and um, because they're young and the type of cluster this is, you can infer an age which is going to be on the order of maybe 10 to 50 million years, uh, which is, in cosmic terms, very young. Okay, whereas globular star clusters are on the order of billions of years old, of age, uh, 7 to 10 billion years old, many of them dating back to the formation of the universe, those stars that populate globular clusters. Okay, I want to go back now to another an object that's beautiful. You can see, uh, if you have an opportunity to get away the remainder of the summer and take a look at the sky, try to get away from the, the lights of civilization out in the desert or out at sea. This is the kind of sky you would see. It's a beautiful sight, one that you won't soon forget. Another one I want to show you, another object that's beautiful, and you can actually see it uh, if you look, no way to look, on a clear dark night, Messier 24. These objects are in Charles Messier's catalog of non-commentary objects. We've talked about at length. Here we go. This is a cluster of young stars, similar to the stars that were in Messier 11, the wild duck cluster. We call it the wild duck cluster M11 because it looks like a flock of wild geese flying through the sky. So a lot of these objects have nicknames. Um, in the case of, the, uh, of M11, it's called the wild geese cluster because it looks like a flock of wild geese flying through the sky. This is just Messier 24. It's a beautiful cluster of stars, open cluster of stars, surrounded by the gas and dust left over from its formation. And you can see that here, right above the tail of the scorpion. Let me show you. Okay, let's back up the sky just a bit, because Scorpio has set a little bit. Zoom in. Messier 24, right here. Zoom back out to get a sense of where our bearings and where we are. Okay, a pair of binoculars, if you look in this part of the sky, find Messier 8, right here, the Lagoon Nebula, which we talked about in the previous video. And here's the tail of the scorpion. Let me put up the constellations so you get a sense of what I mean when I say the tail of the scorpion. See, there's the stinger right there. Right above Scorpio, you go due north through the Milky Way, and you can actually see this, this object right here, Messier 24. In a clear, dark night, even without a pair of binoculars, you can get a sense of where it is right here. This, uh, this um, gas cloud is quite bright, and it stands out um, against the night sky. I don't know if I mentioned in the previous video about Messier 8, but Messier 8 is a what we call an emission nebula. The stars that are embedded in this nebula, in this object, uh, the ultraviolet light, the intense ultraviolet light from these stars is what's causing it to glow so beautifully pink, which is one of the colors uh, of hydrogen gas. We know this is a lot of hydrogen gas here. Most of the composition of this is hydrogen because this is the telltale, telltale color, what we call hydrogen alpha. That's one of the bright lines or the one of the bright colors uh, that hydrogen emits when it's, um, when it's energized. Okay, so we can get a sense of the composition of the gas by knowing the color. Just by knowing the color, by, by observing the color, we can get a sense of the composition of the gas. Okay, so we have Messer 24, we have Messer 8 right here, 
we had M11 before, up further, it's further north. We travel through the Milky Way um, further north. Let me put M11 back for you. It's right here. We'll zoom in on it. M11 is in the constellation of what we call Scutum, right here. Let me put on the constellation names so you get a sense of where that is. Scutum, right here. Right above Scutum is um, Aquila the Eagle. There's a lot, a lot more, a uh, lot remaining in the summer sky that I want to get to in future videos. So we're going to be doing like two or three videos every week. Uh, so we managed to cover the entire summer sky for you. I should mention over here, here's Ophiuchus. This is the 13th constellation of the Zodiac. Why do I say the 13th constellation of the Zodiac? You probably think, wait a minute, there's only, there's only 12 constellations in the Zodiac. Well, actually, no, that's not quite true. There are 13, and here's the 13th one. It's the constellation of Ophiuchus, the water carrier, right here. Okay, here's the ecliptic. Remember, uh, the constellations of the zodiac are those constellations that lie along the plane of the ecliptic, which is right over here. Here's Capricorn, here's Sagittarius, and here's Ophiuchus. The plane of the ecliptic just go through Ophiuchus. It was left out by the Greeks and the Romans because it upset their 360 degree 12 constellation scenario, and it really was the mythology of Ophiuchus, the mythology of Ophiuchus was not based on Greco-Roman uh, aspect. Uh, one of the, the gods associated with the Greek, with the Greeks and the Romans, um, was Ophiuchus is not part of that pantheon or the mythology. So they left it out and left their neat 12, 12 uh, constellation, 360 degree uh, full circle, which would give us 30 days in a month. This is where we get the idea of a month. It's 12 months in a year, 360 degrees. So we get 30 days in a month. So Ophiuchus would upset that balance and that mathematical uh, uh, synergy. And that's why the geometric uh, aesthetics of that. So that's why they left out Ophiuchus. Okay, so Ophiuchus is the 13th constellation of the zodiac. Okay, so let's turn that off. Ecliptic. And I just want to show you um, a telescopic view or a, a wide field binocular view of Messier 24 as the last item for today. Oh, let's also take a look at the moon for tomorrow as well, for the 16th. Okay, here's the moon on the 15th. The moon for the 16th is going to rise about almost an hour later. Every day uh, in the month, the moon rises will be approximately one hour later in rising, or about 12 degrees. If you compare the position here, where it is tomorrow night to tonight, that shift in position is approximately 12 degrees on the sky. Okay. How do I figure that out? We have 360 degrees in a circle. There's 30 days in a month. So 360 divided by 30 is 12. So it's 12 degrees every night, which is approximately one hour as the Earth turns. So every phase of the moon, every night, the moon rises approximately one hour later each night. Okay, so this is the moon tonight, the 15th, tomorrow night, the 16th. Okay, so leave it there. We'll leave it on tomorrow. Okay, continuing around to the south. This is now just about, this is almost, this is 1030 almost 11 p.m. You notice by this time now that a lot of the summer stars, a lot of the summer constellations are beginning to set. That's because it's already August. And next month, September, we'll have the, uh, the autumnal equinox, which is either the 20th or the 21st or 22nd of the month. Okay, so that's coming up in a little bit more than a month from now. We'll have the official beginning of fall, which is the autumnal equinox, in the third week of September. So that's why we're starting to see the summer skies slip slowly towards the southwest. The stars of the um, of the fall will be rising, will, are almost upon us at this hour of the night. Here's Perseus, and here's the great square in Pegasus with Andromeda, and Cassiopeia the Queen. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you um, 
If you liked it, please do like and like and subscribe and share. The subscription to our YouTube channel is separate than the subscription for our public website. Um, don't forget, our, our membership for, at Astronomy for Change is always free, astronomyforchange.org. And we're going to be uh, uploading uh, a number of videos between now, uh, at least two or three every week. So we, it'll cover more aspects of the sky, more of these beautiful objects you can see with even a pair of binoculars. Um, I do want to say, though, that uh, either today or tomorrow, I will be, we will be uploading another video of a about what I thought was a phenomenal project, Breakthrough Starshot, a mission that will see the launch of thousands of nanoscale robotic uh, emissaries uh, to, to travel to our nearest stellar neighbor in space, the Alpha Centauri star system, at 20% the speed of light, a journey that will take approximately 20 years. If any of them survive and get to transmit back images, data, and telemetry from that star system, it will be unprecedented. Hey friends, uh, thank you for joining us again, and please keep looking up.